Hello and welcome to this first episode of Rotted Conversations. I'm actually in the middle of preparing this for video production right now, and in doing so I noticed one or two things that weren't immediately apparent while we were having this Rotted Conversation. Specifically, uh, we were having this over a video group session on Skype. And in doing so, there were some latency issues that caused some audio breakup and some popping and some cutting out. This does improve after the first few minutes of the video, so I do implore you to stick with it. It doesn't go away entirely, but it does improve as the bandwidth kind of finds its footing. So I'm probably going to be looking at some alternative options as far as uh, moving away from Skype or improving Skype or figuring out a way to improve this in the future. But as it stands, I think that this is good enough that I can still produce and just wanted to kind of have this little opener to you know, warn everybody. So uh, I do recommend you plow through it because it is worth watching and uh, we do have some great conversation here. So thank you very much to George, Chris, and Elliot again for joining me here. Let's move on with the show. Hello and welcome to the first ever Rotted Conversation. And joining me here today is George Heffler with the best little horror house in Philly, Chris from the Channel 83 podcast, and Elliot Slade, director of Chasing Rainbows. And uh, what other projects are you currently working on? Covenant. Kevin's the big one right okay. now. Well, I appreciate you joining me here today. And the reason that I wanted to talk to you is the discussion of this podcast, vodcast, whatever you want to call it, is going to be art house horror. And the reason I want to have this discussion is because I've been kind of struggling as of late. Um, as a movie reviewer, I have been tackling some, well, I've been afraid to tackle, honestly. I've, I think I've mentioned this in a few of my coffee and contemplation segments where I've had some issues as far as Midsummer, uh, Ari Aster films, things like that, where I've been finding it more and more difficult to review them honestly, while at the same time being somewhat trepidatious uh, in addressing the community of people that, uh, well, for, for better or worse, can find no sins in them. And honestly, that's kind of one of my jobs is to find sins and to point them out, to, you know, be totally honest to find the good and the bad and to be you know perfectly upfront about it and the thing that I've been really kind of struggling with is um, do the issues that I have with these films is it regarding the films themselves or is it regarding the audiences and the fans of those films and if that's the case that should absolutely 100% not bleed into my reviews so it's something that I kind of need to soul search a little bit on before I begin those reviews. So I brought everybody here. Everybody here is a fan in one way or another of a lot of these movies, the you know Midsummer, In Fabric, and so on and so forth. So really what I'd like to get started with is getting your general impressions of those movies. Uh, just go ahead and uh, I guess one of the ones I want to discuss first and foremost is The Witch. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, why don't we go ahead and get everybody's impression of that before I kind of weigh in with mine? I'll go sure. first. Um, it's one of the favorite movies of all time, maybe, if not uh, certainly horror movie. Um, I have a black fellow tattoo. <laughs> yes, um, I'm getting mine says, too. <laughs> so, uh, so it's definitely uh, up there for me. I think that Robert Eggers does an amazing job of building an authentic, lived-in world, and I think that a lot of that has to do with how much research he puts into his world. Um, it really is spectacular as far as I'm concerned. All right. Uh, Chris, you want to weigh in? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, with what George said, I do really like the period historical that he's coming at, um, Robert Eggers. And I, I do which, but I, I kind of enjoy it more on an intellectual level. I don't find it viscerally frightening. I like production design and things like that, but it's not my favorite okay. movie. <clears throat> I guess, next. As you can uh, probably tell, the witch is is definitely my favorite horror movie and one of my favorite movies overall. Um, and I don't want to go too much into it, but I have a really interesting story. Um, I obviously I studied in uh, a school called Villanova on the east coast, and in our uh, uh, what you call it curriculum, we had to study a theology class. And one of our teachers was one of the leading 
expert in uh, religion through the ages, especially Puritan hmm. uh, religious belief. And part of her curriculum was the witch. I, I'd known it before, but I couldn't believe I went to class and the witch was on the syllabus. And she put it on because she said that it is the most authentic and legitimate piece of like media that shows Puritan belief perfectly. She said there's there's not a lot that is wrong with how they act, how mm -hmm. they see the world, how the story kind of progresses, apart from the right. fantasy elements of it. Um, but I mean, before I knew that, I already loved it. And just there was something so different about that, you know, the witch that, that just struck me. And that I think that was the point in my head that kind of switched me on to this new wave. I call it the new wave of horror. Um, I love it so much. I think it's honestly a perfect horror movie. And yeah, I'm sure we'll go into more of why these movies are, right. are doing what they're doing. Now, well, so. I guess I have, uh, well, a few things on this. Uh, one, I think one of my first impressions as far as the witch goes was something that was a little bit difficult for me to get over was the volume discrepancy. That was a little bit tif difficult for me. Um, that was one of those situations where it, well, you know, watching it in 5.1, in order to be able to hear anybody do any kind of dialogue, uh, those sequences in which the operatic vocals are going on basically almost had my neighbors calling the police on me. So it was really, it was difficult <laughs> to kind of, you know, dial it in to the point where it was, I was able to focus on it because I was so worried that I was going to shatter some windows. Uh, but then if I got that down to an appropriate level, I couldn't hear anybody speak. It was a little bit jarring for me. Um, I, I think that it was a gorgeous movie. Um, and the historical accuracy was certainly something to be um, lauded. Uh, the thing that somebody mentioned, you know, I think it was uh, Chris here that mentioned that uh, you didn't find it to be necessarily that scary. And I had to agree. Um, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was beautiful. Uh, but I really didn't find it to be a very scary horror movie. Um, and not that I'm saying that every horror movie has to be scary. I mean, there's comedic ones and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, as far as we're talking like the upper echelon, I do kind of consider that to be at least, you know, a, a fairly important thing. But, um, oh, um, I, I definitely agree that that's important. But I part of what draws me to horror in general is that uh, what's scary is so that's to true. Every single person. Um, I definitely would never. I would never call it the scariest yeah. movie I've ever seen, but I do find it legitimately frightening at times. Um, especially, I mean, I, I guess this is kind of spoilers, but right yeah, up let, front, let's um, just, they show you that. Let's there just go is ahead and uh, you know all the movies that we're going to be discussing. We'll just go ahead and discuss freely. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah. So there is an actual witch. Mm -hmm. You see her. She kills this. Baby. Turns it into a agent. <laughs> they just they establish the stakes so early, mm -hmm. and they tell you that this is a legitimate threat. Um, and then all you can do is watch this family yeah. fall apart. And that relation and paranoia and disbelief is part of what makes it frightening to me, especially when we know that there is something that they need to be worried of, uh, worried about outside of the family. Caleb comes back and he has the apple in his throat and he you know, convulsing and, and the children can't say the mm -hmm. prayer. Like that is super unsettling to me and gives me chills. Even just the thing I about found it oh, and just go quickly ahead. weighed in. Go ahead, Elliot. Oh, sorry. I was just saying quickly, really quickly weighed in on that. Um, I think my favorite review of the witch is you don't feel mm. comfortable once during that movie. And I think that's what makes it such a good horror movie. The dread of the entire movie. You are not settled right. once. Um, is why I think this is this is okay. top level. For um, me. And dread is an important aspect. And I think honestly, as far as horror films go, that's one of the. I, I mentioned this in a very early review of mine, and I honestly do not remember uh, what it was. It, it might have been actually <laughs> Hagazusa, uh, but uh, I, it was something <laughs> along the lines of uh, you know, there's a lot of different types of fear. Uh, there's, you know, there's the jump scares, the startling and so forth. But dread is something that is kind of rare and a very difficult thing to pull off. And I have to agree with you that it did have that sense of dread about it. Um, now, Elliot, there's one question I have uh, it's for everybody, but I think uh, more specifically towards you as a director here is there's a word that I've been kind of feeling. Um, I, I said it in my review of In Fabric and 
for a lot of these movies, I think that some of them kind of approach it. I think that In Fabric actually crossed the line and went straight into this. And that word is, I hate to say it, but pretentious. Um, when we get down to uh, uh, Egger's films, uh, The Witch and The Lighthouse, um, the question I have is, okay, I'm just going to read uh, for The Lighthouse here uh, something that I see in IMDb trivia here. <clears throat> All right. Have, have we all we... seen The Lighthouse? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, since the film was set in 1890, it was shot on 35 millimeter black and white double X 522 or 5222 film, all while augmenting the Panavision Millennium XL2 camera with vintage Baltar lenses from as early as 1918 to as late as 1938, making the ratio 1.19 to 1, which is practically square. So we're using. Hell yeah. So we're using almost 100 year old Fuck lenses yeah. on 35 millimeter black and white film, which as far as I understand it is only made by one company anymore and they're being phased out. So uh, what I have to ask is, is there a point where as filmmakers going back to this kind of level of just very, very fine grained detail that we approach a sense of diminishing returns? is this something that the light the lighthouse was a beautiful movie i will say that right out of the gate but what i'm asking is is there any point in which somebody could have raised their hand and said can we do this on digital much easier okay so that's a very loaded question in a way sure. i'm going to start quickly by saying i do think in fabric was okay. quite pretentious but i i don't think it's <laughs> in the way i can see what you're saying here um in fabric was definitely more uh it, there, there was a con it, it's trying to it was trying to put the consumerism kind of story but it went a little on the nose in my opinion but that's that's an opinion i'll go in later but in terms of the lighthouse and specific lenses and um how they how they printed it on film and stuff like th for the lighthouse that was necessary digitally Honestly, it would look okay. completely different and take away a lot of the charm. I mean, the lenses they used have certain um, aspect, like what do you, what do they call it? like um, mm -hmm. certain traits that you really wouldn't find on any lens, any modern mm -hmm. lens. That's why I mean, as a filmmaker myself, when I'm looking at uh, camera lenses that I'm going to use, sometimes you do get a vintage lens that just looks amazing. And especially, I haven't actually had much experience going on to film um but i know that that's extremely difficult um especially because it's yes. very very costly and for the lighthouse i mean the product came out looking amazing and it came out looking as intended whereas if that was with a director or even editor who had no idea to use those things you'd be seeing you'd be seeing a, a completely different mm. lighthouse um and i do I don't really like it when a lot of the time when a director or a producer will say use these use these really, really rare lenses just for the sake of it. there's absolutely no point especially a lot of the times in digital unless you have a really, really mm -hmm. good dop um but the lighthouse i think it was absolutely necessary to to do what they did i mean i'm sure you listen to the a24 podcast um with with the uh, talking about uncut and their relationship with the DOP and which kind of lenses. I'd like to say I'm, I would be competent and knowing uh, different lenses and stuff, but there's a whole lot there that is just so beyond me and I can understand it. So there's a, there is a line. If, if you're doing it because you just want to say you want to mm -hmm. use the best lenses, I think there's no point in doing that. But if you're doing it for a, a really specific result that you know is going to work well, it's just the director's call. And I also, I think that to a certain level, I mean, I hate to be like, uh, slippery slope, but if you start doing things just because they're easier, I mean, that's how you wind up with the CGI monsters in the Thing remake instead of the beautiful yeah. uh, practical effects that, that made the original so great in the first place. I think that the challenge is part of the beauty, the pursuit of, of what he's trying to achieve here, and that maybe it not everybody is going to be like, oh, yeah, that made a significant difference for me. But I think that without that kind of dedication that leads him to make a decision like that, that 
the whole thing wouldn't come together the mm, way that it yeah. does. Yeah. And honestly, show. I, I yeah. hate asking the question uh, about this specifically framed around the lighthouse. It's just that's one of the more recent ones I've seen. And the reason I hate doing that is because it is such a gorgeous movie. And it it, it is just brilliant. I mean, the, the shadows and the lighting, everything about it was uh, just brilliant on that front. Um, but it's like I said, it's just kind of something generally that's been in my brain, you know, especially after watching In Fabric. And that was one where I know they're they're trying to, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of a love story to the, you know, Giallo films. And so was Barbarian Sound Studio. But uh, it, I don't know, it, 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 it crossed that line for me. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I'd agree with you there. I think I think the biggest problem with it is just that it's too long. If the if it had cut yeah. at the first half and it was like a short film. I think it would have been perfect. It, uh, it has a great score. It has the beautiful uh, mm -hmm. giallo colors, and I mean, it, it's definitely weird, but it's no, not the definitely not thing in the world. <laughs> you know, uh, there's, I mean, phenomenon. She has uh, a, like a monkey or a chimp that takes care <laughs> of her in a diaper, classic, and communicate with bugs. And that's that's like that's yep. less weird than a possessed yeah. blouse, in my opinion, <laughs> or that's more. Weird. Um, so I just, I, I don't know, I think that you're right that they go a little on the nose with the message of, like, consumers and everything, but I think that they're having a good time. I think that it's, like, a little goofy on purpose, and mm. uh, if they had kind of cut it to the first segment, um, I think that it would have really uh, struck a stronger chord with a lot of people, mm -hmm. myself. Yeah, included. I would agree with that. Yeah, me, I to completely agree with that, because, you know, I don't, I feel like the second half of the story doesn't really serve a purpose. And up to that point, I was really excited about it. I mean, you have a unique story. It looks great. It sounds great. You have a non-traditional protagonist with a, a woman of color in her mm -hmm. 40s or 50s that's a divorcee. It was really interesting. And I thought she did and a phenomenal job, too. It just gets to that point. <laughs> yes, yes, she did. It just, it just gets to that point where some dude's talking about washing machines for... <laughs> The last hour, and I'm like, why? Why'd you do this? Yeah, I, and I think, honestly, uh, there was more of the first segment that they could have explored. Like, you know, it didn't need to necessarily even cut off and, you know, roll credits. I think that they just, the, yeah. Could have continued with that family. Yeah, they wanted it to be an anthology thing instead of fully exploring the the depths of what that first to right. offer, I think. Especially because... There were some kind of like Cohen Brothers aspects to me with with like the bosses. It yeah, felt the very much <laughs> like it could have been uh, a lot mm -hmm. more comedy there. Um, and I enjoyed those scenes. Um, and so I was kind of like it was I was sad that it repeated in the way that it did yeah. and not just further exploring it with the, the right. guys that we had there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. Now, when I was mentioning earlier, uh, when I first started this, uh, I needed to f dissect whether or not I was having an issue with the movies themselves or the audiences. And in our chats that we've had prior to this you know, recording here, um, I, I, like I said, I had done some soul searching and I kind of came to a place where I was able to review the movies. And so... Where I basically landed was uh, movies like Midsummer, and uh, you know, I've already reviewed Hereditary and In Fabric and so forth, but um, Midsummer specifically, the one that I've been really kind of putting off, um, I really enjoyed. I actually enjoyed it better than Hereditary on just kind of a story front level, not necessarily on a scare level. Um, but the, the, I think ultimately the conclusion that I came to was I am able to separate the movie from the fans. But it's something that I've been seeing within the horror communities lately that has been just a little bit irksome, I suppose, is that it, it, it's almost to the point to me where a conversation is unable to be had without those movies being brought up. Um, they are kind of being treated as the the absolute apex of everything horror. You know, you could be asking, well, what's your favorite uh, creature feature? And somebody, will, oh, you should check out Hereditary. Like, what? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, people can't say, you know, I mean, there's a time and a place, and I agree that they are, they are you know, good movies. Uh, I mean, Hereditary, I just think the acting was amazing in there, and I'm really surprised 
uh, that it didn't earn some Academy Award nods. But uh, that being said, I think that there's a lot of really strong points in these movies, and I am at this point able to review them uh, with proper subjectivity. Uh, but uh, what do you, I mean, what do you think about the horror communities? Uh, it kind of feels to me like there's this inability to, I guess, analyze them truthfully, you know, warts and all. And that, that's something that's been a little bit uh, difficult for me because I, a lot of a lot of horror movies will either they, they try to invoke emotion and that can be, you know, fear through jump scares that can be uh, dread through imagery, um, you know, sound design and so forth. It can be a lot of really uh, complex, difficult emotions brought out in very, very different ways, including visual, abstract what have Hagazusa as an example, things like that. Um, and for me, I, I think it's great that we're kind of being the, those that's being acknowledged now, but there's also a part of me that's like, well, where have you been? You know, when, uh, 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 <laughs> brains frying on me right now. Uh, but when David Lynch made lost highway, it's like, well, where were you then? That kind of bombed and nobody ever talks about it. Things like that. And, uh, at the same time, when I do want to have a you know discussion about things that are a little bit more jump scary, a little bit more linear, a little bit more you know ABC you know storyline based as opposed to visual abstract, it's kind of been difficult to have that conversation. So I, I kind of want your thoughts on that. Um, I think that horror is uh, it's been through a lot in the last yeah. couple years. Um, it, it's such a really radical shift from 2000s horror to mm-hmm. this wave of um, that we're talking about now. And I think that in addition to, yes, I agree, uh, certainly there are plenty of great movies in history that people should go back and explore. And, you know, just because it's my favorite movie, do I necessarily think that which is actually the very best horror movie ever made? Who's to say? But at the end of the day, people who are fans of this kind of cerebral horror, it, it's been a while since they've truly had uh, been served in this way. So you're saying that it's kind I of mean, that there's kind of like a uh, kid movie, in a candy store excitement level there. Yeah, I re- I think that this is truly an embarrassment of riches that we've had if you're a fan of these kind of movies. And so when you're getting so much fun stuff to talk about, I mean, the reason that we all love to talk about horror yeah. is because it excites us. And these movies excite me, and I love to talk about them with people. And so there, when someone is like, hey, what's a good movie? And, you know, a lot of people don't like to go back and watch older horror movies. They might think it's corny or they might think that, you know, it's just who cares? I don't I'm I'm living in the present, <laughs> baby. <laughs> like, that I don't for people who are interested in getting into horror and maybe they don't want to go back. This is I think that it's good that these are kind of top of mind because mm-hmm. they are great movies. And even our warts on maybe some people don't like to acknowledge it's certainly people could do a lot worse than being recommended these movies for a lot of different stuff. I mean, maybe not uh, hereditary, but I could kind of be convinced that it follows as a well, creature yeah. feature. I, mean, I would say that, um, <laughs> um, that the strikes that chord on many levels. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I'm just saying that I, I, I totally see your point and, and that it does seem like people kind of talk in a circle about them and, everyone like this is just all talking about instead of being well here's a a movie you might actually not have heard of um but i mean it's it's fun they're fun movies i like them i'm talking about them so the fact that it's such a prominent conversation in the horror community um i think it's okay and and we've been getting more and more so as this wave expands the pool will grow and people will have different opinions and more stuff to recommend i mean at the end of this month i'm really looking forward to mm. gretel and hansel um, oh done yeah. By Oz Perkins. Black yeah. Black yeah. Dancer, one of my favorites exactly that was great and so you know i this looks like it strikes a very similar tone to a lot of these movies so that'll hopefully be another one that we can add to this list that people will be recommending and you know just watching it grow i think is part of the beauty of kind of the counterculture right. of horror yeah. Um, to to your points, Mike, I think there 
This is uh, uh, like a threefold issue in my mind, um, why it's so difficult to discuss these movies sometimes. Um, uh, the word you brought up earlier was pretentious, and we'll just not say what these are or aren't for this uh, argument, but anytime something could be labeled as pretentious, if you criticize it, um, often the first thing that someone's going to say back to you is, well, you yeah. just didn't get it. <laughs> So that is one reason that these conversations so often end up in toxicity right. from both sides. Um, another thing, why these take up so much space in conversation, I think that has a lot to do with the mode of distribution that we have now. People are all watching mm. the same things. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, my local video store isn't going to have what George's local video store has. So we might not have the same points of reference. But with the ubiquity yeah. of streaming, uh, everyone's cut the cord and they're all just watching the same things. So if someone's asking for a suggestion for a creature feature and I say, oh, there's this movie, The Being from 1983 that no one's ever seen, you're going to have to spend $95 on a VHS <laughs> on Yahoo auctions. Right. No one's going to watch that. Um, and the third thing I, I see is sort of a, a reason for this is... Um, the modes of conversation are limited to what they were 20 years ago. You would think it would be the opposite because of the internet, but uh, stuff like Reddit has really um, pushed out other modes of conversation. I mean, when I was first on the internet, it was all fandom-specific mm. forums. So everyone that was on that forum was someone that was in the fandom they're into collecting films. They're into seeking out all this other stuff. Whereas, you know, Reddit's a more right. casual thing. So someone can just jump on there and be like, see one of the millions of threads we see each month. I just saw the thing. It was awesome. <laughs> I just saw Hereditary. It was awesome. Yeah, I, I have to agree. And there's something that you brought up that uh, was a pretty good point there is by having this kind of... Uh, uh, to, to be absolutely clear, I think the, out of all the movies that we've discussed here, the only one that I would absolutely say cross the line into pretentious is in Fabric. Um, I wouldn't apply that to anything else, so I just want to clarify that. But by having films that don't follow a very traditional linear narrative, it does be, make my job a lot more difficult <laughs> as a reviewer because there's a certain gut yes. level that I have to kind of operate on at all times. But when I'm able to kind of deconstruct a story and say, well, you know, I can see what they were trying to do with A, B, and C, but how it didn't lead up into D, E, and F, it could have been fixed by this, this, and this. And that becomes a lot more difficult when things are more visually abstract or more allegorical. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, it just makes it so that that gut level that I operate on just kind of has to grow and has to kind of be the all-encompassing point you know my, my north star as far as that goes um but it does make it a lot more difficult to deconstruct a film and try to find you know how it worked how it didn't because at that point it just kind of does become well i liked it <laughs> and uh so i mean but uh you know that that's not to say that it's bad it's just uh it's just making my job a little bit more difficult but that's one of the things i love about my job um <clears throat> but uh no, go ahead. I got um, what I think, sorry, about, I, I, I'm going to go on the defense of this sure. new wave of horror just quickly. And like was mentioned, um, horror has gone through so much. we all seen, and I'm sure we all live a Nightmare on Elm Street, Hellraiser, all the classics, Friday the 13th, Halloween. And they had their time. And I honestly think, and this might be a controversial view at the moment, that what is creating the divide is Bloomhouse. Um, and I'll tell you why, because... At the end, there's there's a few audiences with horror. There's people who are really into horror, like ourselves, who will watch new and the old and the in between. But then general audiences are usually only being marketed uh, to buy Bloomhouse. I, I really, I again controversial. I don't, I I don't think there is a Bloomhouse film I really like. Maybe Sinister, because they are so formulaic and they are so almost predictable, the jump scares, the violence, and how that has hurt conversation is because when something like The Witch, Hereditary, or Midsummer, whatever, comes out, that people are upset because 
they're not watching they're not they're not expecting something outside of mm -hmm. jump scare violence and those tropes which i found has really hurt the discussion because you can't because you get a lot of people on the other side saying well hereditary is not a real horror movie the witch isn't a real horror movie they absolutely are it's just because we've been conditioned by a lot of the mainstream productions i think that has created such a divide and it's both sides i mean the a24 fans me myself and the you know general audience we're all fighting for one or the other and you can fight for both mm -hmm. i will fight for both there are, you know I, I will i still enjoy a lot of the uh, ifc midnight uh, productions and uh some of the shudder ones i really enjoy um but it, it's us horror fans i would say have a lot more scope and they're open to that whereas if you're trying to review to a general audience you're going to have a massive massive um trouble like you said it's hard to review right who you're reviewing to if it's a general audience a general audience then the conjuring is the best horror movie they've ever seen and then something mm -hmm. like the witch is boring whereas if it's a proper horror audience you can have like suspiria obviously the thing any of the euro horrors um all of that is going to be their favorite movie so it's it's um <laughs> yeah, I feel for you, man. I mean, I, I review movies on Letterbox just because, like, that's me. But I couldn't, I, I, I think I'd be so angry at, you know, people telling me this isn't a horror, that isn't a horror, it should be like this, should be like that. That I just think it's limited the scope of what horror is when horror yeah. can be everything that invokes that feeling, I, I think. Or that's these um... things, so. Definitely. I run into that a lot with my show just because the nature of it, we talk about the best horror movie ever made. And somebody came on and picked Green Room, and a lot of people were like, that's not a horror movie. Like, I, was, a horror. Like, I totally <laughs> disagree. I think it's a great horror movie, in yeah. fact. Um, and so like, you definitely kind of run into that um, divide when you start – getting into some of the more abstract or more genre bending stuff, which yeah. a lot of these. And that's a do. conversation where um, I, I, I honestly really dislike uh, when that gets brought up is that, uh, I mean, it's almost to a certain degree, a level of gatekeeping, you know, that's not horror or real horror fans believe blah, yeah. things like that. Um, and, you know, I think that when we're discussing horror films, like, you know, I mentioned David Lynch's Lost Highway. There's probably people that are going to watch this and they're just like, well, that's not horror. It's kind of, you know, horror, it, it, it has so many gray areas and it has so many branches out there. You know, yeah. there's comedic horror, there's, you know, dread, there's jump scares, there's uh, monster movies. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. OK, we're talking monster movies. Does that mean that, you know, Kaiju is horror? Some will say yes, some will say no. It's just the, the lines get blurred so often that I don't even really like having, you know, that you know, if, if somebody believes that it's a horror movie, then I'm willing to roll with it and proceed with the conversation, in, you know, uh, in that regard. I mean, I've, I actually managed. Yeah, if the director yeah. says it's horror. I mean, I actually managed on uh, April hard. Fool's Day. I don't know if anybody went to my back catalog or not, but on April Fool's Day of 2019, I reviewed the Care Bears movie. I did see and that. And <laughs> I actually managed to do it pretty straight-faced and analyzed it and, you know, like even bringing up, you know, disturbing things about it and so forth. I think, you know, if we wanted to, we could find horror in anything. Um, sure, a lot of people are oh saying Cats is a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I agree that this sort of can, discussion can get into a, a bit of a gatekeepy thing, but my view on it is that if everything is horror, well, then nothing point. is horror. Um, and it's kind of like, uh, I guess, if you could see the goal of these sorts of movies we're talking about now to challenge the conception of what people typically think of as horror, I think a really good uh, metaphor to think about that is, um, have any of you ever heard of Houdini's wand, no. that metaphor? Okay. Uh, no. so, so it's like, say there's a magician on stage and he says, I have... This is Harry Houdini's original wand. The shaft cracked back in 26, okay. so I had to get that replaced. Uh, and yeah. uh, my dog ate the tip, so I had to get that replaced. And it's sort of, okay, if we are more and more removing tropes, at what point does it cross that line to where it's yeah. no longer horror? And I don't have, no one has a definitive, definitive answer to that, but I think it is something interesting to think about especially in well, relation some, to yeah, these I mean, films you, you raise a really good point there and i've heard that uh 
not with Houdini's wand, but I've heard that about, uh, I think, like nautical ships and so forth. Um, but uh, I was watching Parasite. The And my Lord, what an amazing movie. Um, if if Has anybody seen that yet? No? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was great. Then I'll not avoid yet. spoilers, but what I will say is um, if we're just talking, you know, beat for beat on taking society and kind of putting a, a mirror in front of it and uh, showing it kind of the ugly side of itself and then having some uh, violent elements come as a ending result of that. That's as pretty much as far as I'll go with that. I was kind of thinking that I was surprised that uh, generally it's not considered a horror and I was thinking, well, I mean, it, uh, That's interesting. I don't know. Yeah. It's it does it does fall into kind of that yeah I I mean let's, that movie let's has no genre it's possible to have it but yeah it it has comedy it has drama it has horror it has suspense it has thrills that you cannot put that movie in a box and I think that's part yeah. of what makes it so good um I think that um what's really nice about a lot of these movies that we've talked about specifically tonight is that they directly counter the like oh well is it is it not by having a legitimate horrific threat that is like mm -hmm. paranormal or something like the first time that i was watching hereditary i the entire movie i was like uh it's none of it's going to be real she yeah. was just crazy and at the end so when there's an actual <laughs> demon on earth now i'm like oh shit <laughs> this is real it's the whole thing was real and so i actually didn't i didn't love hereditary that much the first time mm -hmm. i saw it i liked it a lot but I that kind of subversion of just the way I was expecting totally on me not a fault of the movie but I just didn't love it as much as I had hoped but going through time and understanding that this was a legitimate like demon the entire time really made me enjoy it more and made it feel much more like a horror movie and I think that that kind of applies to all of these the witch you see right away mm -hmm. that there's a real witch uh, the lighthouse you know there's the, you have like the, the visions and stuff and uh, it follows. There's the demon, right, like literally right away. That girl gets killed in a like just absolutely brutal way. Um, so I, I think that a lot of these movies do a really good job of directly being like, yeah, this is a horror movie. Here is a legitimate direct threat that grounds mm. it as a horror movie. Well, I uh, I mean I kind of want to weigh in on Midsummer, but that's going to be tomorrow's review. So I. <laughs> Uh, suffice it to say, I did think it was beautiful. Like I said, I did like it a little bit better than Hereditary, but I think that kind of just kind of goes on a, um, the, just the narrative. I, I found it to be less scary, but I did find it to be more interesting, like the, the actual fine details of the mythos as they were kind of uh, unfolding it, um, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the ceremonies and the, uh, the visual aesthetic and so forth. I thought um, that it was a little bit more, intriguing to me and i thought that there was an uh an interesting element there kind of underlying things of um i, I guess uh, re uh ownership of responsibility in uh sorry i'm, I'm probably going to go into further detail than i intended to but regardless it was something that was kind of fresh on my brain um ownership of responsibility in terms of okay the uh, main character her boyfriend was going to break up with her. Then she, you know, had this tragedy happen and then he felt guilty about, you know, doing that. But at the same time, there's a lot of these beats that are put into play where he does something. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, he does something that is kind of a dick move for lack of a better word. And then uh, through the conversation, uh, through gaslighting and so forth, uh, she's the one apologizing. And that kind of happens on a frequent level. And then, you know, who's responsible for her pain? Who's responsible for the empathy of what she's going through? He is feeling guilty about not, you know, he doesn't, he feels guilty enough not to break up with her, but he doesn't want the responsibility of helping her. And that's ultimately kind of what we find there is towards the end, she finds people that are willing to take on that responsibility and people that are willing to help her. And, um, I don't know. I, I thought there was just a lot of interesting elements there. I'm ranting at this point, but I thought that was uh, there were elements of that that I thought were much better fleshed out. 
And the one thing that I thought was weird is I, I saw that Ari Aster himself, not to get back into the whole what is and what isn't horror thing, but he said that Hereditary is actually his first horror movie. He considered her, uh, or Midsummer is his first horror movie. He considered Hereditary to just be a family drama. I'm like, <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, well, you got to take stuff yeah. like the grain of salt because William Friedkin would claim up and down that The That's Exorcist point, was not yeah. a horror movie yeah. for like <laughs> three decades. And that is one of the famous horror movies that, that if you ask anyone on the street, is that a horror yeah, movie? Definitely. They're going to say, yeah. Ar- Ari Aster and Robert Eggers actually have that exact conversation on their podcast um, about the genre and what they're calling horror. That'd be really interesting. He actually says that Midsummer isn't a horror. Oh, okay. Fairy tale. And um, yeah, he, he um, yeah. So they, they actually definitely give that one a listen because they kind of in depth about it. They've been brown certain things no actually history is a horror like yeah you can see it's a family drama but the media are putting out so much stuff that kind of can mm. hurt them as well so that, that i think midsummer i'm speaking i guess i think last half an hour of midsummer it would have been mm-hmm. very good it what i personally i prefer history because i love the occult and i love kind of that self-contained story it was just a few elements in midsummer that didn't connect as, as I'll just so I'm not no go ahead chat, right? um, the <laughs> the the um, the inbred mm. uh, child that you you briefly learn thirty seconds they they actually say inbreed and then it cuts a, a shot of the the inbred kid and then it's never mentioned again and it, it was kind of like well on the cut and fall that wasn't was absolutely kind of like. One, it could have been a bit too on the nose, or two, just completely irrelevant. I mean, th- there are certain things I like. Like you said, I love. I think the opening two minutes of Midsummer are some of the best horror I've seen in like years. The with the, I think it was the death scene mm. in the house. I can't. I, I saw yeah. it a long time ago, but I was like, holy shit, yeah. this is going to be insane. Um, but it, for me, I felt like it was actually less. Uh, what you less. Um, focused and it would do way too much and if they kind of sliced that bit it would have been an absolute masterpiece i mean it's what two and a half hours long and i'm, yeah. I'm not not mad mm-hmm. about that i love suspiria i love the suspiria remake that was um something i enjoyed but um yeah i mean midsummer is definitely yeah. a fairy tale and i've really really enjoyed it um i just uh, in terms of a better film in my opinion i think hereditary was way more focused and it's a little bit more well thought out and actually had a lot of subtlety in it. I mean, it's like I, I watched it and I was like, oh, it's the payment side because I've done occult stuff in my movies, so I kind of knew. But so I was seeing like, ah, oh, that's a bit obvious. There's a demon in it. But then I was watching it with my missus mm-hmm. and she had no idea. And so I was yeah. even more, she was like, I don't know what that fucking symbol was. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. it's like, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, not it's like, so it's, it's, and then the, like it's, there's a lot of subtlety where you, it's stuff that you have to go back and, and see. Yeah. Like, there's the, the symbol on the telephone pole where she hits yeah. it. And, like, some things that just kind of make you question how deep the roots of this cult go. Like, the kids yeah. are, when they're in the room, they're watching guillotine videos. <laughs> like, those are either, A, fucked up normal kids. <laughs> like, <laughs> or they're, like, part of the, like, there's so much, like, beheading imagery and, like... <laughs> The fact that, like, they're watching that and then, like, they're baking a cake at this party, that's weird, too. Um, Just so much of, like, the the lead-up to what happens to this family feels contrived in a way that is good. Like, it's contrived in a way that you're like, wow, it feels like a conspiracy. Like, so much is happening to make it go this way. Um, Also, I I did want to just say that one movie that I think really um, got the short end of the stick in terms of people... um, I think insulting it by not calling it horror or directly saying it's not horror was Jordan Mm. Peele's Get Out. Um, A lot of people were saying that that was not a horror movie, which to me is, I think that it's absolutely fine. Um, And it's a great movie. I don't take that as an insult towards Get Out. I see it as a compliment because my impression of the people saying that is, this is so good, it can't possibly Mm. be a horror so you I know, think it's I, an insult to the genre, but not necessarily yeah. really to the film itself. Maybe, maybe I think that it is an insult to the film, though, just because there, 
if he's making it as a horror movie and they're not seeing it, as, then they're kind of, um, not sure. respecting kind of the artistic intent right. of I see what's that. out there. Um, I, I definitely think that it's more of an insult to the genre at large than it is to the movie specifically. But just like it was everywhere to the point where at one point Jordan Peele literally just put out a tweet that the entire tweet was "Get Out" is a horror. Yes, yeah, that was <laughs> like. <laughs> Like that had to be the whole tweet, just so that there was no beating around the bush or misinterpreting mm-hmm. it or twisting it. Like you, at some point, uh, people need to be like, "Yeah, this is a horror movie," just so that this conversation need to keep happening. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think yeah. something that's important, uh, kind of, I, I, I mentioned this a few times in my uh, channel is uh, horror fans. We kind of. You know, there there are elements uh, where we will wind up in different camps, but ultimately it's in our best interest to always support each other. You know, horror, it used to be, you know, a lot of, you know, the younger generation now are not going to, you know, know this, but it used to be that horror was, you know, trying to talk about horror movies in public was synonymous with trying to talk about pornography. And it it, well, it was a very uh you know you were very much on the outside fringes of society and you were kind of told you know it's like you know yeah keep you know, video nasties you know keep that to yourself you know, things like that and uh you know kind of being the uh redheaded stepchildren of the cinematic world and the fans of it you know, it's one of those things where we need to you know see the other camp's point of view look at our own camp's point of view with a sense of real honesty and introspection and ultimately find not necessarily middle ground, but brotherhood and, uh, you know, recognize that, you know, we're all in this for the whole. But I think people like us yeah. will be like that. That's the thing. I think, especially, I mean, we all obviously love horror movies and there is, you know, a lot of the horror community who really do will be very the kind of that type of thing. I've actually not met many people who, really into horror you know it's like this new wave it's more like the i i honestly think it's the 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 arguments are coming more from the general pop yeah. population kind of the either the people who don't know it very well who are being introduced to horror i mean if you if if someone came to me and said you know what what horror movie is your favorite and which one should i watch the first one i actually say is go watch I never say The Witch. I'll say, I'll say ease yourself into The Witch or Suspiria or something like that. But go watch Green mm-hmm. Room. Go watch Blue Ruin. Go, you know, go and then then maybe The Black Coat's Daughter because that is kind of a, a a similar one. Instead of you know, yeah, it, I wouldn't because you don't want to upset. I remember I had a person. I was actually recommended to recently Tom. He he works in Cardiff in the film industry, but he knows nothing about horror movie, and he actually struggled at first watching Hereditary because it wasn't mm. anything he expected. And then he he was talking about how much he loved The Conjuring. And then a few weeks later, he was actually like, wait, uh, just my entire view of horror was skewed by either trailers or marketing or what 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 I've been kind of told that horror is. It's, yeah, but I'm glad the, the horror community itself, very, um, the, the diehard fans seem oh, yeah. great to get on with, like, you guys know your horror, um, which is amazing. You can go reference bloody old 70s films. Or you can reference, you know, movies that are out a few few months ago. But that's, you know, we're probably a percent of the population. Um, especially the percent, of, you know, there's probably 50% of horror ones that have a really strong interest in horror. So, yeah, I don't know where that was going, but... <laughs> Where's that? Well, you know, I tried to, uh, with all of my reviews, I mean, they've kind of evolved over time, but uh, with all of my reviews lately, I try to kind of have a wrap up thing at the end. You know, I do the scoring and then I'll say generally whether or not I would recommend it. And uh, there are very, very few movies out there that I will say, you know, I would advise against watching. For the most part, even if I think that it's kind of a negative Mm -hmm. review, I'll try and find an audience for it you know if this is kind of your thing then you know okay i guess go for it it just wasn't my thing and that's one uh area that i landed with with uh like okay hagazusa that was one where i really could see how it was a beautiful film it didn't resonate with me but i could see how it yeah i could see how it would resonate with other folks and so that's where i recommended it but then a movie like possum 
that did resonate with me. And, you know, it's kind of like, what's the difference between the two in terms of like the visual abstraction and so forth? I don't know. It's just kind of one landed with me, one didn't, but ultimately, you know, here you go. Um, but yeah, I, I do love, I think, uh, especially moments like this where we can kind of uh, chat in a way that kind of takes us away from, um, you know, compressed forums and, uh, you know, things like that. And we can kind of really have an open dialogue in a way that, you know, like uh, Chris mentioned, like Reddit, um, you know, it has its place, but a conversation like this, it, it's, a, it's a little difficult just with the format of the, of the forum there. What are your favorite movies, everyone? I mean, I think that's quite important to kind of get into or would be interesting anyway to kind of see which where we come from. I mean, that's a tough one. Even just like a top, not even a top five, but I don't know, just to kind of know where we all are. Well, I would probably put The Witch as my number one favorite horror movie. Um, number two, I might go with Day of the Dead. Um, I think that it is really underrated. I yeah. think that it's the yes. best of the original I love trilogy. Day of the Dead. Um, when Joe Pilato is getting torn in half, <laughs> baby, that's my happy place. Um, it's a great movie, and I definitely recommend it to people who, who maybe have seen something like The Witch and are looking for something that isn't necessarily at the top of the cultural conversation. I would definitely recommend Dead. Uh, yeah, so I can say my absolute favorite horror movie is uh, Cronenberg's The Fly. Mm. Fuck yeah. Um, <laughs> and the other two that I always bring up that necessarily be my favorite but represent things I love about the genre would be uh, Waxwork from 1988 and then uh, It's Alive, uh, Larry Cohen. Um, so I guess... You could say I really like uh, creature features, but I also like, you know, Cronenberg's fly and it's alive. There's a subtext there that Mm. I enjoy as well. What modern creature feature would you enjoy the most? The void. Yeah. Yeah. Hands down. The void is so good. (laughs) Nothing comes close to that within probably the last 20 years. Oh, jeez. I mean, you know what? That's kind of as far as you know my favorite horror movie goes. That's probably the question that I'm asked most frequently, and I have the most difficulty answering. Um, <clears throat> it, it it just varies so much, you know, depending on my mood. But um, I think I'll always have a soft spot. Uh, there's a movie from Thailand called Coming Soon, and so few people have watched it. And I've been trying to, you know, I've been beating the drum trying to get people to watch it. It's it's. It's not the best movie in the world, certainly, it, but it, it's just definitely one of my most favorite hidden gems. I had so much fun watching that. Um, the writer of The Guest and Your Next was actually just talking about that oh, movie he? on Twitter. So uh, it's, it's, yeah, so it's on my watch list now because of that, so it's crazy to hear. Oh, nice. Well. Yeah, I really recommend it. Coming soon. So good. Uh, I mean, like I said, definitely also, nothing. I uh, want to shout out uh, Friday the Thirteenth. Oh, okay, I forgot. <laughs> Which one? I said I forgot to shout out Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. Also love. Um, I think my favorite <laughs> is like the big budget, or well, I guess <laughs> big budget slashers would probably be uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Three, uh, Dream Warriors. Um, Dream Warriors, I mean, baby. The Great first, song. first, first Great nightmare song. definitely has like you know the the big place in my heart, you know, being what it is. But my favorite of the series is three. Um, I'll go to bat for two. Also, I think that it's yeah. uh, Freddy's Revenge. I think is so good. really excited about that documentary coming out. Um, I think it's called Scream hmm. Queen uh, about it. That really interesting. But I think my favorite uh, overall is kind of a tie between 1963's The Haunting and 19's, and 1973's oh, yeah. The Legend of Hell House uh, with Roddy McDowell. Um, those are two. I mean, I am, I think my, you, you're, you're a creature feature man. I am a haunted house man. And uh, that that's, that's where <laughs> I love it. So. <clears throat> I guess I'll, uh, I'm going to put the new wave behind. The Witch is probably number one. The Black Coast Daughter up there, but to Jackson's Mm. It is one of the first kind of introductions to, uh, <laughs> to that type of, Splatter? I guess, yeah. indie genre in a way. Yeah. I, I just, like, it's insane. And, yeah. I mean, I, the thing is there too. I mean, the thing's just a classic. It's probably really cliche for that. But, I mean, Brain Dead. just, I remember watching it and I was like, holy shit, I was 12 or something. And I 
felt dirty, <laughs> but I was laughing and the lawnmower scene, the bay, everything. Just, yeah. And then and it's by the guy, you know, Peter Bloody Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, and then it's see, funny. You know, bad taste and it's just like where did he, he started as like a <laughs> horror bloody director the, the rings match yeah him, so. it's great i i love that kind of uh, that whole vibe as well i mean chris mentioned it's alive earlier um all those kind of like larry pen and Lauder, mm-hmm. early peter jackson stuff um all really great i love brain dead as well is really oh, night the creeps as well yeah that's, oh. that too yeah sorry yeah. as you said that take itself too seriously which i think you can't i don't know a film recently that has kind of done that uh thoroughbreds was one actually i watched recently that maybe was a little yeah, bit like that maybe. but um if you guys can recommend me any kind of modern that that's i mean i know we have that uh i mean the guest get yeah the guest and um, your next bit kind of follows that a little bit um, but I find that quite rare. I'd, li- I'd like to see more kind of in the tone of Dead Alive or Brain Dead mm-hmm. in the UK, it's called, or Night of the Creeps. Um, that'd be a really interesting comeback genre tech or like vibe to have, which yeah. uh, I hope we see more of. Yeah, I think the one that I think of off the top of my head when you mentioned that kind of vibe is the newest Puppet Master movie, The Littlest Reich. Yeah, I didn't see that. Um, is it good? Or is it worth I would say that it's uh, I, I went through and I watched all of the Puppet Master movies and that was the big franchise push that I did. It was 13 movies and after the first uh, after the first one or two they just got progressively worse and worse and worse and it became really really painful but then the last one was this uh, it's not even really so much a remake I guess just kind of a reimagining um of uh, the littlest Reich, and I would say that it definitely has that sense of uh, fun to it that uh, that that I think you're talking about here. I mean, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's one kill in particular where I had to pause the movie because I was laughing so hard, I was actually missing out on stuff. I had to give myself time to compose myself. So um, yeah, I, that's you mentioned that kind of uh, ideal. I think of. I think of Puppet Master Little East Reich. It's it's a flawed movie. It's not a great movie, but it is a fun movie. Oh, oh I think. Uh... Oh, okay. There I we was go. muted. So, <laughs> I think that uh, I think a movie that kind of jumps to mind for me um, that kind of fills that vibe is the recent uh, Satanic Panic. Um, it's very kind of silly and over the, but it you know has a lot of that splatter and gore as well. Um, there's some really good effects as well which is a huge part of why those movies are good to me um i love seeing the little alien pop up and brain dead and <laughs> talking he's like a little puppet it's great and so uh, like having that kind of um emphasis on the effects and the makeup i think is a big part of what gives me the vibe and so satanic panic and to a lesser extent the babysitter um kind of give me similar uh, oh, yeah. um, and i also want to make a quick mention i know it's not a movie but even so along this line it's tough to do a whole lot better than Ash versus the Evil Dead. Followed the actors perfectly <laughs> in tone. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. shout out to Evil yeah. Dead Two as well. That's yeah. I forgot about that. That's up there. Evil Dead oh. Two is is like <laughs> the one. <laughs> we uh, we just did an episode what? about. That. Sorry, can I quickly ask you? I know I don't want to take it, but how did you guys get into horror? I think that's a really the horror fans like ourselves it's actually quite interesting and how similar it can be of how you got into the genre so much well for me it was um i don't know i was kind of raised in a very strict uh you know christian household that the when the rules got bent they got bent in kind of a weird way i remember being exposed to watching the uh, aliens in the theater when i was probably five or six <laughs> Uh, but then I wasn't allowed to watch, you know, the Terminator at home on VHS when I was at a friend's house, um, things like that. It was just kind of bizarre. But, uh, for the most part, I wasn't allowed to watch horror movies, but we still kind of made a family trip to the video store. And while everybody else was kind of, you know, browsing around for what they wanted, I would beeline it for the horror movie section and just kind of look at the back of the VHS covers and, you know, look at the grotesque things, evil dead Two. It was probably a decade that I actually watched the movie, but a decade prior, I became entranced with the the box art. And uh, I don't know, there was always kind of mm. that sense of the fun macabre. And uh, 
you know, I, I would watch Vincent Price stuff. I would, I would have exposure to horror films as long as they weren't too bloody and gory and violent. And then by the time I, you know, gained my independence and so forth, and I was able to freely uh, expose myself to it, I just dove in head first and uh, never really resurfaced since then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so for me, I, uh, so I actually ask this question on every episode of my show. Um, I also agree that it's a fascinating question and a great way to kind of get, um, an idea of where someone is coming at the genre from. And I've definitely found that uh, a lot of people have a similar experience to me where, uh, I got scared off of the genre very young, where I was kind of exposed to it too young. <laughs> was like, nope, I'm a little cowardly boy. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> and uh, and so I was on a school trip um, in Washington, D.C., and in the hotel room, they pack you in like six in a room to try and save on money, and um, <laughs> everyone wanted to watch the It miniseries, and I was too scared to say that I was scared. <laughs> so I'm sitting there cowering in the back watching that, and I was like, I'm never watching any horror again. And for, for a couple years, every time I tried to like get into it, just wouldn't stick like uh i have a big thing with like fear of needles and then i tried to watch saw 2 because that was like right in the thick of when I was the needle up. Thing. Except, you truly still one audition? of the most upsetting scenes truly one of the most upsetting scenes to me still um, and like i was just like no like i just i literally left that was all i saw of that movie i had to leave the theater <laughs> because i just couldn't handle it but um uh, a couple years ago, I mean, probably going on like five five years ago now, like I just started getting more into it where I was like, all right, I need to – like I can't be a horror fan or I can't be a movie fan and be like, oh, there's this huge section of movies that I just don't experience. <laughs> and so I, I was like, all right, I need to break myself of this. So I started off with like – a lot of the campier classics, like Friday the 13th, which is part of why I have such a love for that series, um, because they were kind of, they were fun enough that I was able to still see them. And, it, uh, and I think that slashers really lend themselves to it because it's it's much more just like, ah, someone's getting cut, oh my God, as opposed to like, oh God, there's a demon behind me, I'm never sleeping again kind of thing. Um, so I think that kind of using those classic franchise as a launching pad gives you one really good uh, exposure to um, a wide variety you know you get your like, paranormal stuff with freddy you get your straight slashers with jason halloween is obviously going to give you kind of an insight into some of that burn kind of stuff um and you really get a good exposure by just exposing yourself to those um so that was how i started in yeah um my story i guess is kind of similar to mike's i uh my parents were also very religious so much so that it probably would have been like the 25th re uh like 25th anniversary of the exorcist it came back into theaters my parents took me to that and very, uh, somberly explained to me that this is actually something that mm. could happen <laughs> so <laughs> that movie oh scared God. the shit out of me um, but so they never allowed us to watch horror movies, really. But I had cousins whose parents let them do whatever they wanted. So when we stayed over at the cousins, that's, you know, raid blaster to watch whatever you want. So, um, you know, six, eight years old, I'm cutting my teeth on the straight-to-video trash, like Carnosaur and Ghoulies <laughs> and stuff like that. Ghoulies. And as um, oh, soon as we got an internet connection, the first thing I did was to get on horror forums and just immerse myself in it and uh i guess also it's kind of similar to what george was saying because i would go through all of those franchises which was kind of difficult in those days because your blockbuster have master one and two it's missing number four and three <laughs> but uh yeah i guess uh that's that's kind of my story behind it Yes, mine's similar a bit of a bit of all of them uh i mean growing up i wouldn't be allowed to really watch them went around my friends and saw Starship Troopers. <laughs> and, uh, oh, hell like, yeah. This is insane. <laughs> I was like, I love this. And um, then I'd go to that friend's house on weekends and we'd just watch trailers, just trailers for horror next on YouTube, all these old ones. And growing up, my parents would give me 
a pathetic amount of pocket money a week, a pound a week to go to shops, thrift stores, I know they call them in the US. Um, <laughs> and it was often five for a pound uh, on VHSs. So I would go in and just pick everything off the shelf. And my parents weren't too mad about it because they were always old. It was like, I remember getting finding the stuff and was so <laughs> excited. And my parents were like, oh, look, you know, they're old. There's no harm in them. But I was, you know, I was getting deeper and deeper into the genre and just ended up stayed up watching from I remember from like 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. during the summer holidays this like 10 year old just watching VHS is over and over and over and just just from there I mean the love comes from just watching all the shite all the good stuff and just you're a horror fan then I'd say once you've, <laughs> once you've seen enough yeah. of it so yep. yeah uh, also just genre. reminded me uh, by talking about Starship Troopers I would say Paul Ver and another director could be argued uh, people are like oh not a director mm-hmm. is a horror director uh, just because um, a lot of people are like oh it has like a lot of commentary and stuff and it's it's just satire but like I, I no think there's a lot of horrific stuff um, the in, brain like, that guy explodes <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's horror if ever I've seen it so yeah, well we're right. uh, we're edging in on our about our time limit here so um if everybody wants if anybody wants to kind of give a shout out to anything they're working on any projects they are you know anything they belong to you know feel free uh okay i'll start <laughs> so uh, i'm on twitter at gerg hef um that's g-e-r-g underscore h-e-f um, I'm also on Letterboxd as well. That's George Heff. And uh, you can also, I mentioned that I have a podcast as well. It's called The Best Little Horror House in Philly. Every week we talk about the best horror movie ever made, according to our guest at least. So we've talked about, you know, a lot of the classics. Like we've talked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre already. Uh, we have an Alien episode coming out. But we've also talked about some of the more specific stuff that speaks directly to that person we've talked about the faculty with someone's pick we've mm-hmm. talked about the strangers as like an underrated movie from 2008 that kind of is a straightforward slasher and that really spoke to this person so we really get a, a, an awesome variety and it's just us talking about their experience with horror and what makes this movie great um and so it's a very positive experience which is something i also like to do um because we're really uh, full kayfabe i'm in on it uh I, I agree that it's the best horror movie horror movie ever made while we're talking about it. So we really um, it's 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 a good time. So check that out. Uh, we're on anywhere that you can podcast Apple Music or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, All right. the lot. <clears throat> and uh, everybody here, uh, go ahead and just uh, you can leave me your uh, you know Twitter information. Any any information you want me to go ahead and put in the link. Uh, I'll put in the link below in the comment section as a pinned uh, item here. So you can kind of, if you want to check anybody's uh, material out, anybody's sources out, you know, feel free there. So. Yeah. Brilliant. I'll give you all a follow. So i have just uh, shout out um, Instagram, Elliot Slade or Twitter. They're the two ones I kind of push um, made a, the latest series covenant is based on Clive Barker's and dying the video game. So if you're into that, um, definitely check it out. That's something I've been working on in Dublin for the past few months and it's cost absolutely everything so uh, yeah uh moving to february so just i guess follow the updates on social media so uh, yep. uh, i'm do a podcast as well that's uh you can find us at channel 83.video um you know doing movie reviews not too dissimilar from rotted and uh yeah i tend to cover some pretty obscure stuff so if that sounds like something you'd be interested give us uh, check us out we're on twitter and letterbox as well channel 83 for everything all right <clears throat> okay Perfect. well george chris and elliot thank you so much for joining me here and uh i, I hope you. that we can uh, do this again sometime <laughs> all right yeah definitely all yeah, right well, take care everybody and yep yeah, i guess that's about the best i can really think to sign this off <laughs> without rambling too much all right take all care right. everybody <laughs>